So <laughs> this uh, this is joint work with uh, Tushan Rayu at the World Bank. Uh, this is a work that we started in 2009 as a, uh, as a, a bigger package of reform in uh, Punjab, in Pakistan. And uh, one, one, one important uh, fact about this project is the following, is that this is not a pilot and this is not a, a uh, experiment that is not on the scale. Mm -hmm. This is a policy of the government and it's a policy that was implemented in a very large scale and right now towards the end of my presentation I am going to tell you what is the second phase of this project. So uh, what, I, what I want to stress is this is a policy and it's not a, an experiment. So this is a a, a project about a teacher incentives and let me let me start with the motivation of why this project uh, start um, the government uh, was doing a bonus program in several schools in, in Punjab Pakistan and when we start talking with the government we said to the government hey why don't we change the program that you have which is based on sports activities uh, towards the two objectives that you have. Why don't we try to link a program of bonus with the objective of uh, higher learning, measure as test scores, and uh, enrollment rates. And the government was very sympathetic with the idea, and the, uh, we start a dialogue with the government and basically this project is kind of a, a conversation with the, pro, uh, with the government and uh, we suggest different parameters of the, of the intervention and the government uh, <coughs> suggests different ideas and this is the end result. So, um, and in that framework, basically the, the, the general idea is the following, uh, we know for several uh, research that, that we have that teacher performance matters for student achievement. We know that. Uh, but teacher performance depends on the teacher uh, capability and the teacher motivation and effort. And there are several researchers that are, that are posing the, the, the hypothesis that what happened in a lot of uh, developing systems is that teacher effort and teacher motivation is not there, and we need to change the incentive that the teacher have. And uh, this, uh, this hypothesis is backed up with data that shows that there is high absenteeism rates uh, for teachers across countries, and there is, uh, when we find the teachers in a lot of the schools, they are off task. So, Basically, there is some data that supports the idea that teacher incentives are uh, failing somehow, and the idea is, okay, let's try to change the incentives that teacher has. Um, and uh, there is a lot of projects that, uh, uh, that have been uh, looking at uh, the idea of changing the incentives. And, uh, one of these uh, projects are performance pay initiatives, and uh, they are in two flavors, one is small pilots and uh, some uh, large scale uh, policies. And the bottom line, my reading of this literature is that it's very mixed. And it's very mixed in the sense that some of these programs have provided positive results, others not. That provides a challenge in the following sense is, we don't know if it's mixed because context uh, matters, meaning that we don't know if these policies are very context dependent, or we don't know if the design of the programs, programs that are performance pay initiatives, are different and we don't know what are the margins that we need to change. But my reading of the literature is very mixed. And this is one way to read it. There are successful programs in the sense that you have these teacher incentives that 
elicit the final outcome that we want is higher learning of students measured by test scores. There are mixed uh, or conditional success of these programs and there are unsuccessful programs. And in this, uh, uh, in the literature is all over the place. There are, there are some hypotheses about uh, the control variables that you are incentivizing uh, and the idea there that is very concrete is if you incentivize variables that are under perfect control of the teachers, that program is more successful than if you incentivize uh, the, uh, the objective in a variable that is not under control of the teachers. That's one hypothesis. The other one is that teachers don't know how to convert the incentives into actions that actually change a uh, student performance. But in any case, there, we think that at least our reading is that teacher incentive programs, the literature tell us that is a uh, very mixed. So uh, I want to tell you what is the, the program design that we have, that we, that we try. Uh, I am going to go into the details later, but I want you to have the general idea of the program that we have. We have a program that is the following. We targeted three provinces in Pakistan, in Punjab, and those provinces were uh, uh, with the lowest student achievement of all uh, provinces in, in Punjab. Uh, the program started in 2010, and it is still uh, ongoing. And the program offered teacher monetary incentives based uh, in three variables. And these, these incentives are a bonus a, that are cash on top of the regular payment that they receive. What are the three variables that we, uh, that we put incentives on? We, we put incentives on gain on average in a standardized grade five academic test, the gain in total school enrollment, and the student participation rate in a grade five academic test. Why do we do that? So the first two, the change in test, in test scores, uh, basically uh, is one of the objectives of the government to increase learning in, in these kids. That's why we put it in grade five. This is the national, the, the, the statewide uh, uh, standard test. The second one, uh, school enrollment, is still as you are going to see, there is a huge uh, uh, space for uh, for uh, improvement in enrollment in Pakistan and in Punjab. And uh, part of the uh, role of the go of the schools is to increase enrollment. So thinking in small villages and uh, what one of the uh, activities, regular activities that the uh, teachers uh, do or should do is to before the academic year start, they go uh, visiting a household and they go getting, uh, try to convince a household uh, to send the kids to the school. So those are two variables that are at the objective function of the government. And the third variable was just to prevent uh, gaming the, the, the incentives in the sense that if you put uh, some weight in test scores, one of the incentives that the, that the school can have is to uh, not uh, allow the weakest uh, students to participate in the exam. So in the, the third variable there, as the objective of the program, was a deterrence of a, a negative incentive that the program can elicit. And there are four types of schools, and this is one of the, we, we thought that this was one, one of the contributions of, of this paper, is the following. We tried to vary it, the role of the head teacher in the incentive program. And what is the idea there? The idea is that there is some literature that tell me that head teacher, as the leader uh, organizer of an institution, the school, can be very powerful. So the leader can reorganize the school in certain ways to elicit the best outcome possible, and we want to test that idea. So what we did was we had 600 schools, uh, 150, only the head teacher received the incentive, 150, 
all is, uh, teachers receive the same incentive and 150 school the head teacher receive a higher incentive than the teachers but the teacher also received the incentives and again the idea is that if you have a strong leader that's the literature if you have a strong leader that leader can reorganize the school in a way to elicit a higher a test scores and higher outcomes. So th that, that, that is the general overarching uh, idea that, that, that we are doing. So let me, the, the two questions that we have is, can monetary incentives to teach a link into school performance increases to an achieving test score at a school enrollment? That's the first one. And the second one is, can monetary incentives to headmaster increase overall school performance? So I am going to give you some of the background. The background is still the net enrollment rate uh, in primary level is very low. In Punjab, it's around 72%. There is a lot of uh, space to gain in enrollment rates. Uh, there is a lot of space to gain in, in learning outcomes. Uh, there is this work by Andravi et al. Uh, it's very interesting that follow a household and follow a schools in time in Punjab. They show that learning outcome is that they are very low, and they are very low, particularly in government uh, schools. The government school system, the provider the majority is uh, the government and account for 60% of the primary school uh, students. And uh, the system has five years of primary, three years of middle, two years of high, and two years of higher secondary school. That's, uh, that's basically uh, the, the system in Punjab. There are 54,000 functional schools that comprise 70% uh, uh, primary schools, 100,000 uh, teachers, and 2.6 million uh, enrolled uh, children. And uh, again, comparison between public and private schools, the, the <coughs> comparison is very dismissal in terms of uh, the government schools uh, fare very low with respect to the private schools. In that setup, I am going to go to the more details about the program that we are going to, to talk today. So the program uh, was approved by the government, by the provincial government in 2009. And the initial year of implementation was 2010. Um, again, the main objective of the program is very clear. They, they want to improve school uh, participation, enrollment, and student achievement. That's the basic uh, two objectives of the program. And uh, we, are, we, we are going, we link the indicators of this program to uh, main uh, indicators of the, of the system. We have the annual school census, which give us enrollment data, and we have test scores that uh, are uh, based on this PEP uh, test, which is the, uh, the district-wide uh, standardized exam in grade five. They have two, uh, two exams in grade five and grade eight. We took the grade five because that's uh, the, the, there is more homogeneous uh, uh, the homogeneity of, of private school uh, or primary school, uh, but we decide to go with those two indicators as the the, the main indicators for for the program. Uh, the the data came from the annual school census, uh, which is uh, reported by the schools and that has some checkups from authority into the schools. It comes from, again, from the Punjab Examination Commission PEC test, and it's uh, standardized uh, in grade five and, um, and eight. We are going to take only grade five. And the test uh, is curriculum link and cover multiple subjects. And we select only, a, for our program, we select four subjects. We select Urdu, we select English, we select a, math and we select uh, science for uh, the, the bonus. Uh, the provincial education department is res responsible of designing and managing all the, the, uh, the annual school census 
and the peg uh, test. Um, how do we strike the, the formula for the bonus? So the formula for the bonus is a, uh, is a composite score that is a, the, a measured by the three variables that I was discussing. The first one is the gain in test scores, annual gain on average of the school. The second one is the gain in enrollment rates, uh, annual uh, percentage gain in enrollment rates from one year to the other. And the third one is the percentage of kids taking the exam as uh, the number of kids enrolling in grade five. Uh, we put the weights based on the discussion with the government as you notice, we put more weight in the test, then we put a weight of 25% to the enrollment, and we put a 15% weight to uh, the number of kids that were sitting in the exam. Um, this is the formula of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the payment of the bonus to teachers. There are three treatments, only head teachers receive the treatment, all teachers receive the treatments, and the head teacher receive higher uh, payment than the other teachers. And the formula is a uh, 1,000 times this composite score, 1,000 times this composite score for head teacher and teachers, and in the treatment three, we have higher double pay for head teachers than for teachers. Uh, never can be negative with, because of the way we are we are doing it. we are doing it. Uh, we we said if the uh, increment in enrollment is negative, we set it to zero, and the same for 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 test. Don't give up on gain the, the system. In which sense? I, I, if I know that I'm I'm uh, kind of rewarded for the gain, I'm making sure that this year performance is very weak, so that I can make. A uh, that can be a possibility. We don't see any difference. Uh, we don't see any uh, changes negatively to reverse to the mean in the next year. Uh, and um, and uh, basically, we we basically we don't see that type of behavior. But that's a possibility. But we don't see that behavior. Yes. How big is student mobility in these schools? Are you, do you have a lot of turnover? There is very little uh, mobility in this school. These are very uh, rural areas, and mobility is very difficult because they need to move from uh, one town to the other, and the mobility is very low. Uh, something that we thought about uh, very carefully was try to measure not uh, student mobility, but teacher mobility. The data is very, very weak, to say the least. But we couldn't try to. We couldn't find any uh, movement of, of teachers either. Yes. So it looked like from the data you were showing before that there's a, on average about two teachers per school. There are three teachers per school, and I haven't showed that data. Uh, oh, okay. well, maybe, okay. but, uh, that doesn't vary from school to school. It's always sort of three. And do they do they all teach in <coughs> grade, or are you going to show? Them? Right. Of course, it varies from school to school. <laughs> It has some the start and deviation, and it varies but more or less. There are some schools that uh, the, the variation, let's say the variation can be from 12 teachers per school to one teacher per school. The one teacher per school is very, very unique case, but more or less on average, we have three teachers per school with a standard deviation of two, uh, two, students, uh, two teachers. Yes. 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 So, um Earlier you gave us some motivation I found compelling around it was something we discussed earlier, how incentives will work best when teachers understand how to map that, map their actions into receiving <coughs> the award. But as you're presenting this, I'm wondering, do they understand this? Is this possibly too complex? And if they do understand it, how do they think about what they're gonna do to raise test scores and also get more kids uh, in the school? What's that, could you sort of unpack it? that logic model, because I'm wondering, especially since the abstract suggests no results, if it's simply something they didn't understand or didn't know how to execute actions in order to I think that there are two questions in that question. Let me, let me go for the first one. Do we believe that 
first of all, there are some impact of the program. There is no impact in the variables that we want, but there are impacts in one variable that we didn't want. So there, there is some impact of the program, and that suggests, moreover, that suggests that actually teachers understand very well the structure of the program. I am going to argue that, but that's the first one, is do they understand the program? And something that we did that was kind of interesting was we made uh, seminars with the teachers explaining the formula, and we explained what type of action they can do in order to increase the formula. So basically we said, okay, <laughs> if you actually teach, you may impact test scores, and this of course is very important in the formula. So, or if you go uh, to the household and, and get the care, that can have an imp important uh, uh, impact of the formula. So we, we kind of made the seminar saying, okay, this is the formula, and this is the way you apply. And moreover, we somehow we make a check of, hey, do, you, do they understand the formula? <laughs> And the checkup that we that we did in the seminars were positive. They understood the formula. So we don't we argue that they understood the well the formula. Moreover, we argue that they understood very well the formula. I'm going to show you why. The second thing is, do they know what to do in front of the incentives? And that's the last part of the discussion that I want to that I want to have. So let me show first what they didn't do, and let, then uh, let's, uh, let's speculate more about what is going on. But fair, uh, th that's, that's where I want to, to lead us is to that discussion. So how was the targeting? <coughs> the targeting was a two-step uh, targeting. One is we find uh, the districts that with the lowest uh, uh, average score in the in this examination. Once we find this district, we uh, uh, go to the uh, ones schools that have the lowest uh, test uh, in in baseline. We organize the schools uh, in uh, from uh, one to twelve thousand, which were the, the final sample, and then we. Uh, made a, a group of four and uh, based on that uh, rank index and the group of four we allocate in the different uh, four uh, groups. Control, treatment one, treatment two, and treatment three. So we have a, a, a two targeting, one at the district, at the, at the, at the district level, then at the school. Um, so this is the design of the experiment. We have in treatment one, we have 150 schools. The head teachers were eligible for level one bonuses, and uh, other teachers were not eligible. So I just write to these schools and I say, look, we are going to measure in this way, and the person who is going to get the bonus is the head teacher. Yes. Uh, on average, the bonus was 16% of the annual uh, salary. So it's not a small amount of money. For these people, it's a lot of money. And uh, moreover, it's in the upper side of this type of incentive programs. Um, treatment two is a 150 school. Uh, all teachers have the bonus. Treatment three, 150 schools, uh, head teachers were eligible for a level two bonuses, uh, and the other teachers were eligible for one level uh, bonuses. Again, the motivation is the master head teacher as the source of organization in the school, and we say, okay, we are going to try to motivate that. And we have uh, 150 controls. Yes. Usually, it's him. Uh, 
unfortunate. So uh, it's for the, he can do whatever he wants with the money. We give the money to the head teacher, and the head teacher can decide whatever he wants to do with the money. If he wants to distribute it to the other teachers, fine. Uh, if he wants to keep it to himself, fine. But it's for him. Um, and we didn't say anything about how he should uh, or she should spend the money. Uh, yes? I mean, is head teacher basically the same as the, the school principal or in the school? Uh, usually the head teacher is the most important authority in the school. There are some cases in which you have a principal and a head teacher, but the head teacher is the person who actually takes the decisions in the schools. Uh, the, 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 the head teacher is the, for sure is the person who organized all the uh, teaching load of the school and is the person who is in charge of uh, solving all everyday problems of the school. So it's the most important uh, organizational factor in the school in Pakistan, the head teacher is. Um, <clears throat> so we have data for four years Something about this evaluation is that as, as an evaluation is very cost effective because we use administrative data. The data that we are using is the same data as the program data. We are having the, uh, the different rounds of the uh, annual school survey and we have the different rounds of the PEC data and we have a baseline data that it was uh, at the beginning of uh, at the end of 2009 beginning of 2010 and we follow the schools in four years uh, and uh, this is a uh, kind of the of 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 the our sample 600 schools with the rest of all the schools in the province 42,000 schools and there are significant difference between our sample and the rest of the schools that can pose a problem of external validity. Uh, definitely these schools that we choose, uh, again, were in the uh, three poorest districts of, of, of Punjab, and uh, that represent the difference between our sample and primary schools. Uh, let, me, let me go, uh, uh, I, I am going to discuss uh, the characteristics of our schools in three seconds. This is the, there are three basic, two basic uh, estimations that, that we are going to do. One in which we pull all treatment, so treated versus not treated, and one in which we open by treatment. Treatment one, treatment two, treatment three against uh, control. We have, in all of the specifications, we have fixed effects at the randomization block, and we have fixed effects at the district level. We have a standardized errors cluster at the TESI level. TESI is uh, the uh, village level. And uh, for the outcomes of enrollment and test taker, given the way it's constructed, we are using the information at the school level. So the, the maximum number possible of observation in those uh, two variables is 600 schools. For the uh, test, we use the variation of the uh, student, uh, and, 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 and we are also exploring uh, that uh, variation. Is that also something else in school? Say it again? Is that, that like the level of clustering is something else in the school? The clustering you know is at the decil level. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but is that one school? Decil is the village level, so decil is a village. Mm -hmm. Local schools. There are some cases in which you have two schools, or there is a case that you have one school. Yes. Okay, so uh, let me show you something about the internal validity. The internal validity, we have uh, the, these are variables at the baseline, and uh, these are variables at the school level, and basically uh, none of the uh, coefficients are, are positive. We also, uh, None of the coefficient are statistically significant. We also have joint tests, and uh, basically we have a very balanced uh, treatment and control. We also open this by uh, treatment one, treatment two, treatment three, and we find the same pattern. Uh, these are uh, variables in the enrollment and test scores at baseline. 
and again we have a very balanced uh, sample between treatment and control mm -hmm. there is no significant difference between uh, this one uh, we normalize the sorry we standardize the test score uh, to to be the, the control at uh, mean zero and standard deviation one and every year uh, so you can read all the impacts at the school level at the test uh, as uh, standard deviations and uh, I want to tell you how do you read the enrollment and test taker uh, results so so far let me pause three seconds any questions right now okay so I am going to show you results in three variables I'm going to show you results in yearly enrollment in test take uh, uh, participation uh, test take rates and uh, standardized test scores uh, again uh, the enrollment and the stake uh, percent uh, participation rate it's at the school level test scores is uh, we use a uh, individual variation so uh, these are the, the the effect in terms of enrollment uh, this is the same structure of all tables column two are the pool treatment the treatment is one uh, for any treatment zero uh, for the control and a specific uh, column four it's when we open treatment uh, one two and three and uh, we show the coefficient impact of the of the regression this is the enrollment rate and uh, it's telling me that uh, for instance, in treatment schools in 2011, there were 1.6 less students than in control schools. And basically what we found is that there is no effect in enrollment rates. The treatment schools, uh, all these estimates are uh, basically not statistically different from zero. And uh, despite, the, despite this fact that in 2011 it was a uh, more negative less negative and positive we read as basically zero effects in enrollment rates uh, when we open for different treatments uh, we don't find again we don't we don't believe that there is any effect uh, by, by by different treatments there is a uh, one negative a uh, negative number here in uh, treatment uh, four and uh, treatment three uh, but basically we read this as a uh, zero effects when you open for treatment what about test so uh, uh, in terms of test again that's a pool treatment and open treatment and basically we find zero effects uh, from uh, from any treatment and uh, despite the fact that the treatment three yields positive uh, coefficient here, significant here, and positive here. But again, we take this as no, we, 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 we take this as no effect in test scores. So no effects in enrollment, no effects in test scores. What type of size? Oh, yeah, I, I do I think of precision here to say so. Uh, uh, precision, uh, yes, I, we don't see these particularly unprecise estimators. Uh, this is an error, a, sta, a standard error of 0 0.07, which uh, basically is under the, the, the precision of, of a lot of the stories that I know. I don't think that the problem is precision per se. I think that the problem is this are zero. <laughs> Do you think that is a problem of precision? I, I don't know whether you can exclude uh, like the positive findings that others have found. Uh, definitely, this is well uh, in the line of other of other studies, uh, and. Of 
minus 60 percent is kind of a wide band, you know. Which number? Uh, I'm looking at column like 2012 and then the, the first one, like that's 0 0.063. Mm -hmm. and then a, a standard error of 0 0.08. Yes. Yes. Uh, look, uh, I think that we have power to detect uh, the different uh, if the, if that zero point zero six is a zero or is uh, the fact that I have a, a very imprecise uh, estimate. I we we run some power analysis and definitely we don't rule out the possibility that this is just a zero effect. Um, but I don't I don't see this as particularly imprecise in the sense that we don't we, we this is well in the range of, of, of this type of estimator and 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 basically we, we we are seeing that all these point estimates are zero. Um, and moreover I we we don't the, something that is strike us is that uh, the coefficients go from the, the point estimate is 0 0.005 0 0.06, 0 0.002 is fluctuating from from uh, from a negative positive. The only one that has some kind of uh, stable uh, positive estimation, which, and which, which would be consistent with that gaming story, you know, that it goes up and down. Uh, look at this. Uh, these are the test scores, and I can show you this in time. And basically, in time. They, they increase a little bit each year in the whole de, uh, in the whole distribution. You don't see, for instance, one year in which the mean go back and, uh, and forward. So basically, what we are reading, I can plot I can plot this in the same in the same one from 2012 and 13. And if I show you the role, it's increasing a little bit every year. We don't see uh, the type of story that that that, that is gaming. Uh, dropping and then going up. Uh, what about test takers? So this is the only place in which we find effects. Um, for treatment three, it's positive uh, all the way. And in the year 2013, it's a positive effect. So we are increasing from more or less a baseline of 92% test takers, which is very high, to 96, 97 percent uh, test takers. So basically, we see that the schools are responding to this program, seeing more people in the exam. So no effects in, in enrollment rates, no effects in test scores, and positive effects in test takers. What is interesting is that that's the variable that we just put for avoiding gaming the system. So that's the variable in which we said, okay, we are going to put this variable so that teachers will not select the pool of students that sit in the exam. And that's the variable that we see uh, effects. So let me unpack a little bit these results in four ways or five ways. One is, okay, the fact that we have uh, more kids <coughs> even if it's 3%, 3.3%, sitting in the exam, that fact uh, may lead to a different composition of kids taking the, the test. And that may mask some of the null effects of test scores. So that's a possibility, even if it's just 3%, that's a possibility. So what, can, what we did, we did uh, an estimation that is a parametric approach and the strategy is very simple. We feed a Tobit model to test data at artificially sensor it at different points. So we sensor at 5%, we sensor at 10%, we sensor at 15 and we sensor at 20 What we want to see is two things. One is the difference between OLS and Tobit estimates, but the second one we want to see a, a stable a coefficient of the Tobit because the idea is, the assumption is that those no tests will have a scores below the artificial sensory point. So that's one, one way to, to test this idea that 
is not a, 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 a will it be this test effect explained by a, a selection is a, the treatment schools sitting at this three percent lowering the test scores and we follow this procedure so how is this table um, in panel a we uh, pull the treatment in panel b we open let me discuss the pull the treatment so i have in the first row i have ols in the second row i have the toilet estimate the i have no sensor it uh, for the 2013 and I have sensor at 5%, 10%, 15%, at 20%. Uh, and what we find is that basically, in terms of a uh, test uh, in 2013, the effect is again zero. And uh, it doesn't matter how do you, in which part of the of the distribution you sensor, the coefficient is the same one. It's 0 0.03 minus 0 0.03. And the only one that has a, 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 a estimate that is higher and a little bit uh, unstable is treatment tree. And again, first of all, it's not uh, significant. And secondly, we don't, we, we don't make that much about that. So again, I, we think that this rule out the hypothesis or the possibility that what is lowering the test scores is this uh, uh, selection of students. The second question that we ask is, hey, what about the heterogeneity? There can be, given that we have different schools, the uh, heterogeneity can uh, be driven the results. What we did was the following. Exactly when we were doing the, the, the block uh, randomization, we did it precisely to measure heterogeneity effect by different levels of uh, uh, performance at baseline. So basically what we, we did is that given the randomization, given the, the, block, the block randomization, in this table we broke by baseline the, the schools that were below the mean, above the mean, of test scores at baseline. We, we, we did several specifications, but I am going to show you that one. So the specification, it has a, the treatment variable, the variable that is indicator if it's above the mean of baseline test, and the interaction. And again, we don't find any single effect, first of all, from the bullet treatment, as we found before, and uh, not the interaction. And uh, uh, we keep th uh, finding this in test takers rate, the 3.3%, and basically uh, that effect uh, uh, you observe in below or above the mean uh, baseline uh, school, uh, school test, and uh, you find uh, that, that, the, 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 that effect, the only effect that we find applies to any type of schools. Uh, in terms of test scores, uh, mm, this coefficient is 0 0.22, uh, which uh, with the pool treatment uh, coefficient that uh, is, is uh, positive. Uh, we uh, did a lot of tests uh, trying to see if, if, if there is something there. And again, we find that uh, we don't believe that uh, we have uh, effectors. So, Again, we don't believe that the story is about the heterogeneity of schools responding differently to this uh, uh, mechanism. What about a, four, a, a third uh, hypothesis, which is, hey, can we observe any retention of students before they reach to grade five? So one, hyper, one, one, one action that the school can do is, hey, let's retain more students before they reach uh, grade five. And of course, the, the idea is that to retain the weakest one, you allow only to progress to grade five, the, the strongest one, and uh, that can inflate the, the test scores. Uh, however, when we uh, run the same type of regression for the enrollment only from grade one to four, we didn't find any of this behavior. So <laughs> we rule out composition, we rule out heterogeneity, we rule out 
uh, some type of reg uh, uh, retention. Even when you don't find effects on the uh, on test scores and enrollment, that that doesn't mean that the school didn't took ineffective actions. So one of the things that we say, okay, fine, the schools may be doing a lot of things that are very ineffective, and uh, we try to measure that. And basically, again, zero effects. So in all the variables that we can measure about the inputs of the school, the school didn't change uh, anything. So we can open this by different treatment. In this table, I am showing you treatment versus control. And in any of these uh, infrastructure variables or uh, ratios, or a different type of, of uh, input of the school, we didn't find any, any results. So basically, what we are finding is zero effects in enrollment, zero effects in test scores. We don't think that uh, these are driven by uh, imprecision. We think that uh, basically uh, these are uh, zero effects. And we find a positive effect of test takers of 3%. So I am coming back, question of your, which is, hey, first of all, do they understand the formula? And for us, this is a prima facie that they understood the formula. They did the only action that was the most cost-effective actions that they can do, which is we are going to see kids in the exam. And they didn't react to the incentives in terms of better pedagogy, or in terms of better teaching, or in terms of better practice, or in terms, and they didn't react. They re they didn't react to the policy uh, trying to collect a, a high a no, a number of of uh, kids. What we th there are based on these results. There are some people that can claim, hey, the problem was implementation of the program. And we know the context of Punjab very well. And if something, this program was well implemented. If something, this program is well implemented. And moreover, people are super happy with the program. And we ask, we are quite puzzled, we were quite puzzled about why people were happy with the program, why the government that has this program uh, that gives some important amount of money is happy. So the government says, look, the teachers are happy with the program. And why weren't they? They don't have to do anything. They just see the kids. And somehow, it's kind of a random shock to receive the bonus. Why? The, we, we, we show that uh, uh, in the paper, we show that the effect of the program in the index is zero as well. So it is not that with seeing the kids, they, they, they were able to, to, to in, in, increase the, the index in a, in, a, in, a, in a systematic way. At least the weight of, uh, of that variable is very small. And basically, the, the, the teachers, receive a surprise at the end of the year saying, hey, you have a bonus. And there is a lot of support for the program uh, from part of the teachers. Given that there is a lot of support from part of the teachers, there is support from the government. Uh, <clears throat> so we don't, we don't believe also that the program uh, lack uh, uh, incentives in the sense that we believe that the amount of incentives is very important. Uh, we calculate on average, this is a, a bonus that gave 16% of the yearly uh, wages of, of, of the teachers. So we, and, and that 16% that uh, of the yearly wages of the teacher is an important amount of money. Uh, for sure is on the high uh, side of a teacher incentive program. And we we believe that 
the two hypotheses, the most important hypothesis that can explain the lack of results are the ones that, that we're discussing. One is that, one that is, that is not obvious is that the problems of these schools <coughs> are so systematic that there is nothing that the teachers can do to solve the problem. So one hypothesis is that these schools are overwhelmed by problems and they cannot do anything. The teachers cannot do anything to solve the problem. The other one that is uh, uh, that is uh, posed uh, by several actors says, look, the problem is different. You have this incentive and teachers don't know how to respond to the incentives. In other words, they don't know what are the actions that they need to do in order to change the test scores. So our, uh, this hypothesis in the context of this program has some problem, which is the following. Do you notice that we have three variables? We have the test scores, we have the enrollment, and we have the test takers. So there are two actions that the teachers can do, and they are under more or less control that they have. They can go to the households to try to get these kids. There is a larger margin for them to get to the households and get the kids. And actually, we have other programs in which actually that, that is something that is feasible. There is a lot of space and there is a possibility for uh, the school to do that. So in the case of the test scores, yes, maybe that's the case that the teachers don't know how to react to the incentives. They don't know what to do in classroom. They don't know what to change in the pedagogy. And definitely, uh, that can be the case. But it's very unclear uh, why uh, it's not the case when uh, we said, OK, go to the, to the village, uh, collect kids, and bring them to the school. So what, what are we going, what, what, where are we heading with these results? The government is super happy with the result. The government don't want to change the program. So what we did to the government, what we, 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 we convinced the government to do was the following. Let's go to other districts, and we are going to change the program. We are going to change the program in two ways. One, we are going to keep with the most promising uh, intervention, which is the treatment tree, which is the incentives that are more to the headmaster, uh, but also to the teachers. These are going to be groupal uh, incentives. And we are going to do two things. One is we are going to have uh, information to teachers on how to react to the incentives in terms of class management. So we see the problem as the following. There are two main components of the teacher practice. One is the content, and the other one is class management, what the teachers do in class. And we are trying to affect the class management part because we believe that changing content is very difficult. So we are going to try to induce changes in class management. How are we going to do that? We are going to do it in the following way. We are providing teachers with very concrete actions that they can do in class management that we learn from a context uh, of very poor schools here in the United States, with uh, schools that uh, target uh, low-income uh, populations here in the United States. So we have a set of menus of things that the teachers can do. And what we did was we went to Pakistan and we run, and we, we have been doing this in, in different countries, in, and we are modifying the, these tips to the context of the of 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 the of the different places. So we are going to give these management uh, tips to the uh, to the teachers, and these are actions <coughs> that we pick them based on uh, the simplicity of the actual action and the simplicity of transmitting the message. And we are going to transmit these uh, tips uh, uh, by cell. This is our, our, our proposal. 
is to try to transmit this uh, uh, this type of class management uh, in a systematic way by itself. I don't know if we can do it in Pakistan. We are doing it in Uganda. Yes. So all of your efforts are aimed at the effort margin, and there's nothing at the selection margin at all, right? And so you, you have to have a strong belief that you can, through more information, sort of improve the effort margin. And where do you get that belief from? Eric, I, I don't have that much strong beliefs in my life at this time <laughs> of my life. <laughs> You're telling the, telling the government of Pakistan on your beliefs. You must have strong beliefs. I, I, am, I, am, I am saying the following. I see there are two types of teachers, one that are the stock, and the other one is the, uh, the inflow. Yeah. So those are two different teachers. So the government is saying to me, hey, I have this stock of teachers. I, have, I already have these teachers. I cannot forget about these ones. What do I need to do? And my only hope is clearly, given that this is the stock, given the policies that, that we have, then we need to start thinking how to change the behavior of this stock. I totally realize that the flood is different. And I think that where, where a lot of potential is in the flow of, of teachers. However, the flow of teachers is a long-term policy. It's you are going to start thinking, hey, you need to start picking better teachers, and you need to start uh, training better before they enter the profession. And I don't have any, I don't have any doubt uh, about that. The government uh, right now is trying to see how can they change the flow of teachers. And basically, that's a problem of changing not only the way we select the teachers, but also the faculties that the teachers arrive. And that is, again, is a, a, it's a long-term uh, program. The government said to me, I have the stock, what do I need to do? And clearly, uh, there, are very f there are not that much policy uh, leverage that we have in order to change the stock. My only hope is that, hey, let's try to change the incentives and let's try to give them more information. And that's why we are, we are doing that. But definitely, I, I totally agree, the flow of teachers, probably that's more promising and probably that's where the future Yes. Yes. So, uh, uh, the intent to group incentives for the school. So, one one hypothesis of all along these lines of why teachers didn't respond is that, that from the perspective of any individual teacher, there's you know a potential collective action problem. Like, I may be willing to change my behavior, but if I'm working in a school with you know four or five other teachers, uh, I have to believe that they would also change their behavior. It may be rational for me not to do anything if I think they're not going to behave as well. So Seems like a simple test might be to look for heterogeneity of treatment effects uh, by the size of the school or the number of teachers uh, that were working in the school. I don't know if that's something. Uh, we try. Let me answer. Let me answer in two ways. One is <coughs> that type of heterogeneity is endogenous to the program. The problem is I can I, I can fix that at baseline the number of teachers, but clearly the number of teachers can't respond to the program, and that's something that is is problematic. Uh, the second one is, look, we think that uh, the whole idea of the head teacher, which is a very interesting idea, and and again we don't see any 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 response from there, is that. The collective action also is a problem of the head teacher. So the collective action and the organization at the school, the head teacher, in theory, is the person who, let's say, what are the typical actions that the head teacher can do? The head teacher can say, OK, there is a teacher that is very ineffective. I am going to either move it around or, or change it to a, 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 a not to teach math, but to teach 
I don't know what, and to try to reorganize the school in that way. So basically, one of the theories behind this uh, experiment was uh, the head teacher is the person who can solve that, uh, that, that, that organization. Granted, the head teacher will say, hey, everyone worked very hard, and everyone uh, believed that the guy next to, to him is working, so they say, okay, I'm not going to work, and we have the free rider problem. However, we don't think that that's the case. Uh, uh, something that we suggest to the government was, hey, let's, do, let's try to, to test the hypothesis of individual uh, bonus versus the collective bonus. Uh, something that I didn't mention is, when we were discussing the, the design of this program, we, we put a lot of effort in trying to implement the program that, that follow a good design in terms of incentives. So let me, let me tell you a couple of things that we discussed. We discussed a collective versus individual incentives. The government, the government says, look, I am not going to go for an individual uh, program. We are going to go for a collective program for, for the whole school. Uh, we couldn't we couldn't pass that. The other one is uh, we uh, we said to the, the government uh, wanted to have a program that was uh, uh, that target the level of the test, and we convinced the government that targeting the level of the test was not only not appropriate but also the motivate the weakest school to try to get into the program, and basically the government by the idea of uh, changing the test. We, uh, uh, we, we convinced the government to include four items in the test and not only math and language. We convinced the government, hey, let's try to get more items in the test uh, because if you only have English and, and math, that can reduce the task of all teachers towards that task. And if you have or do English, math, and science at least, we have a, a no reduction to uh, only two tasks. Uh, we also, uh, so we try things in terms of the theory of, of action, and one of the things that we discussed was a group up versus individual. Again, the government says, look, we are not going to do group up, uh, individual. Uh, we don't believe that this is a problem of free dialer. Uh, we try to, to try to estimate, given the variation at baseline on number of teachers, however, number of teachers can respond endogenous to the program. Yes? So I'm thinking about your attendance, as, as student attendance numbers. Is it, do you know if it's rational for kids to go to these schools? Uh, Tell me more. Well, if they, if they go to schools that don't learn anything, it might not be rational for them to go to schools. And your theory is that if you just tell them school is good, they'll go. But you know, the question is, is it legitimately rational for them to go to these schools? If they're bad enough, the kids are wasting their time, and they ought to be doing something else and not going to these schools. Again, I can answer in two ways. One is the, the, the one that, that there is the practicality of the policy in the sense that, hey, school or teacher go to the household of these people, try to convince them, and they go to the household and they say, hey, send the kid to the school, and the household says, no, you are a waste of time. That's, that's a possibility. Um, we have other experiments in which actually what happened is that when the school arrives or when the school is uh, uh, active, families start going to the school. So yes, there may be the case that this is a failing public school and the failing public school were not able to induce uh, uh, kids uh, to come. Definitely that, that, that possibility exists and uh, we cannot do anything. Do I think it's rational for them to school, to go to school? I think that it's rational in several ways, even if they don't learn, 
uh, math, they can learn other skills that are important for society, like <coughs> socialization, whatever. And uh, at least they are in a, a safe environment. So from the point of view of a policy, the policy, I think that, uh, the, the policy maker, I think that it has a, leg a legitimate claim that says, hey, we believe that it's important to induce more enrollment in the schools, uh, even if they don't learn. So I, I can understand why the government might want to do that, but it's the kids that I wonder about it. and if I don't know fun job, but if it's the classic a quarter of the teachers are absent on any given day, um, then it may not be rational for the kids themselves to want to do this. Yes. I totally agree and we cannot rule out that possibility. We cannot rule out the possibility that actually the teachers went to the families and the families mm -hmm. didn't uh, allow the kids to go to school because it, uh, they, they, they respond saying, no, it's a waste of time. We cannot rule out that. Uh, we we talk with some of these uh, schools and basically we ask the head teacher, hey, did the teachers went more uh, to the households to try to convince families? And our, our almost interviews, case, whatever, which I will not back up in any serious conversation, is no, they didn't, uh, they didn't were more active going to uh, recruiting uh, more kids. Uh, but that possibility, I cannot rule out the possibility that refusal of, of families to send the kids. Did you look at the teacher absent? We have some data of teacher absenteeism, and uh, the data that we have uh, don't show any response in terms of teacher absenteeism. I am not showing that data here. Uh, we are debating if we want to show that data uh, because it was after one year of implementation of the program. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to the households and we asked the households about the school and the household, uh, but it's uh, after one year, and this data is administrative data. But the data that we have from the household, we asked the kid, last week, does your teacher were absent? And the answers were very similar, 27%. Yes? Um, I have two questions. Um, one is that I happen to work with In this one? In the school education. Not this program particularly, but with the school education okay. department. Um, so my question is that, uh, so given that I have some field knowledge and also I think Anjabi's paper also and the Leeds report pointed out that some of the private school kids actually take exams with the public school children and they actually use the same EMIS code that is for the public school to take exams. So was, was that accounted for that the kids in the government schools are actually part of the private school? So, the first question, uh, again, this is administrative data. This is data that come from the uh, PEC. This is the, 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 the exam. And uh, what we understood from this data is that they arrive to the school and they take the PEC in the school. They don't, they, it's, it's a school-based uh, test. And uh, basically, uh, the, the, there can be some kids that are that are going to the private school or the private schools in this test. Uh, I I cannot I cannot tell you if it is true or not. What I understood is that 
basically these are kids that go to this school and uh, that are in the, the public system. Second, again, when we started this program, there was some kind of resistance from the union to the program. Usually union don't like this type of program. But after the first year, when, we, when, when the program started handling the bonuses, uh, the, everyone was uh, happy. There is the problem that you mentioned is that given that it's a randomization, there are some schools that are not in the program. We don't, we, we haven't, for some reason, I don't know why, we haven't uh, any resistance to the randomization and to, to some schools uh, being a part of the program. There is no, as far as I, I know, there is no uh, backlash or any contentions about the program from the teacher union. Again, think that this is a bonus that you don't do anything and suddenly happen. That's the type of thing that unions like. Are head teachers part of the union? These teachers? Yeah, the head teachers, are they part of the yes. teacher union? Yes. The vast majority, yes. And they are very strong uh, unions. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>